Hello again. We are about to start. Uh, Clau, are you ready? Okay. Now I can see you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, can you see my screen properly? Okay. So, thank you very much for attending this um, this uh, seminar on uh, sound immersion, organized by uh, the Our Soundscapes project seminar series. Um, I know most of you already know about the project, but uh, let, let me start with a brief uh, introduction um, about the Art Soundscapes uh, project. Um, it is a ERC uh, project which uh, deals with uh, three main aspects, uh, sound, rock art, and uh, sacred um, landscapes. And uh, it tries to determine how uh, these three components interact uh, together. To do this um, rigorously, um, the principal investigator, uh, Margarita Diaz Andreu, brought together an interdisciplinary group of researchers uh, coming from uh, different backgrounds, including archaeology, um, engineer, uh, engineering, um, et ethnography, um, psychology, uh, etc. Um, working um, around art soundscapes and uh, exploring perception and the interpretation of uh, uh, sounds in uh, the parts uh, related with the rock art sounds. Um, to achieve this uh, purpose, we work in six different research uh, lines, including rock art, acoustical physics, uh, psychoacoustics, neuropsychology, uh, ethnography, and uh, sacred landscapes. Uh, all our work is based on uh, the data we gather uh, during field work, and the project started in uh, 2018, uh, despite the pandemic. <laughs> we uh, managed to finish, uh, to complete it almost um, all the field uh, work so far, including uh, rock art areas in the Mediterranean um, area in Europe, uh, Siberia in Asia and South Africa, for example. So if you are curious about uh, our uh, research work, our activities and our results, um, I invite you to visit uh, the project website and our uh, Facebook uh, web page, um, where you can consult our uh, latest new and so on. Uh, one of the activities uh, we are doing as part of the project are these seminar series, and it's why we are here uh, today. Our invited speaker today is Claudia Nader. Um, Claudia is an audio engineer specialized in immersive sound design for audiovisual media and sonic art installations. Uh, they is currently working as graduate teaching assistant and researcher at the School of Arts and Creative Technologies of the University of York. Her um, mixed background, uh, thanks to the technical studies uh, she did in Mexico as part of uh, her engineering degree in the sound and production of uh, popular music, is a perfect combination with uh, the master's degree uh, she completed in post-production with sound design at the University of York to work in this type of uh, topic in her PhD, which is uh, based on the physiological and psychological responses to different sound formats in ASMR, including media and the feasibility of using this type of media to support mental health and well-being in youth. Um, I had the pleasure to meet uh, Claudia a few years ago and work uh, with her at the University of York. And 
I have to say that uh, apart from being an amazing uh, researcher and lecturer, uh, she is also very committed with uh, the promotion of um, inclusion, gender equality, uh, diversity and accessibility in audio industry and education. Um, she actively works uh, voluntarily with different organizations, uh, for example, with uh, Soundgirls uh, organization. So I think it's worth mentioning these kind of things. Uh, today's seminar focuses on SMR uh, indicing stimuli with different levels of immersion. And she is going to share with us the uh, preliminary results of her uh, research work. So without further delay, I leave the floor to Glow. Thank you, Glada, for being here with us. Uh, thanks, Lydia, for that uh, beautiful introduction. And thank you, um, everyone, for uh, attending the the seminar. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Let me just share this. Mm -hmm. Cool. So hopefully you see my screen right now. Uh, my screen, everyone can see my screen. Yes, no? Yeah. Yes, yeah. perfectly. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Cool. Let me introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Clau Nader and I'm a sound engineer. Um, I'm a sound designer, uh, very, very interested in anything immersive media. I'm based in York at the moment, uh, finishing my PhD. Um, I'm also a teacher at York, uh, teaching post-production and production sound for film and TV. And I'm currently collaborating in some um, in some uh, collaborative research projects on well-being with the Department of Education and also the Health Sciences uh, Department, um, just to use uh, digital media interventions uh, for well-being. So, uh, welcome to Sound Immersion, Objective or Perspective, exploring ASMR inducing media exposure and its benefits in well-being. That sounded like I'm selling something. I'm not selling anything. So uh, just a little overview of this uh, webinar. I highly recommend that if you don't have your headphones at hand right now, you go grab them because we're going to use them um, in uh, a few minutes. Um, just a, a little overview what we're going to be uh, covering today. So first of all, I'm going to explain to you all what is ASMR because um, you might be familiar with the term but um, I, I can't assume that everyone everyone knows it. Um, then what ASMR media, inducing media is. Then I'm going to um, share with you my main research question. What uh, the last nearly five years, four years of my life have been about. <laughs> I'm going to share with you how I did some experiments and we're going to test you um, to see if you're a tingle head or not. And after that, we're going to compare your experience with the experience of my participants and see if there's like any uh, similarity or not. So again, if you don't have your headphones at, at hand, just go and grab them now. So let's crack on with ASMR. What is ASMR? First of all, the term stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. And the term was coined on social media around 2010 by um, a lady called Jennifer Allen, who's not a scientist. I think he's, uh, she's just a, a, um, a cyber designer or something like that. But the term is not precisely scientific. It was just coined by this person. And um, after a lot of discussions on online forums about this, um, really weird sensation that feels good. So ASMR is a physiological and psychological experience in response to sensorial stimuli. Um, most of the time, um, there is presence of tingles in the head, in the scalp, in the neck, in the spine, um, even sometimes in the limbs, in the shoulders. It's accompanied by relaxation and some people experience as well mild euphoria. Um, but what exactly triggers ASMR? So 
we have ASMR in real life, just with everyday activities, everyday real life stimuli, but also we have ASMR that people um, experience through consuming audiovisual media or any type of, of digital media. Common triggers, both in real life and in media, um, include socially intimate encounters, this is not what you think. <laughs> um, socially intimate encounters such as going to the doctors, going to get a massage, having a haircut at the salon, or being um, at a makeup artist session, for example. So all of these um, events uh, tend to be like a very one-on-one -on -one, uh, space, it's very intimate, and um, it's very um, the, it's very funny that all of them uh, include close personal attention. So um, it's not everyone experiences ASMR and not everyone experiences ASMR in these uh, environments, but it's very common. So if you go to the doctors to get your eyes tested, you might have experienced ASMR or not. Other common triggers include tapping, scratching, sometimes brushing. I don't know if any of you, when um, your parents or your grannies were combing your hair when you were a kid, maybe you experienced ASMR. I did experience ASMR when I was a kid. Uh, when my mom uh, tickled my, my back, I would just feel like tingles in my head and like a warm sensation that, that came and, and went and so on and so on. All the triggers include whispering and even thoughts. If I'm having a very fascinating conversation with someone, it's very likely that I'm going to experience ASMR. Or if I imagine myself experiencing ASMR, then I can have ASMR. It's really weird. So why do I say real life and media? When these uh, forums, online forums, started to um, be so so interested in ASMR and these sensation weird sensation that feels good. Um, people started recreating common triggers that they remembered from their childhood. Turns out that most people who experience ASMR experiences it since a very early age. So they started filming themselves and sharing those videos on YouTube, uh, nowadays TikTok, Instagram, etc., etc. So um, just recreating all these triggers. And um, if you uh, go to YouTube and just type ASMR, you will find millions and millions and millions of results of ASMR. You will find uh, people uh, giving like massages on screen or people whispering around microphones. And you will notice that most people who produce these type of videos are weirdly female presenting, which is of interest. Not much research is done uh, so far about the, that precisely, but we we can um, we can um, uh, hypothesize that there is some element of close personal attention or caregiving because of the stereotypes of and, and because although like stereotyped roles. Um, associated with uh, caregiving to females as well. Um, sometimes in these videos you see different types of microphones. Sometimes you see them on screen, sometimes you don't. Uh, for example, um, on my uh, the, the one at the, the upper left corner, you see the person, however we don't see their face, we only see hand movements and we see a stereo array. In this one, we don't see any microphones. In the right side, on the right side, we see uh, a dummy head, uh, potentially recording binaural sound. Then this one is a stereo microphone, not precisely binaural, but it's a stereo one. And uh, finally, a 3DO microphone, um, which is a binaural microphone. Here, we don't have any any microphones. However, we have an actor uh, playing the role of a physician uh, conducting an eye test. So we have like this combination of, of videos, some of them with speech, mostly whispering, some of them with no speech. And um, all of the roles uh, that, that these people play 
are directed to the audience. So I was very interested that um, so many people just report on social media that these type of videos help them with uh, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and even chronic pain. And as a good uh, sound designer and sound engineer fascinated by immersion, I was like, hmm, do you think that sound immersion uh, might be linked to, to ASMR? So I thought I could test maybe uh, mono, stereo, and binaural formats and see if people have more or less ASMR depending on the audio format. So that was my main research, research question, uh, for which I designed an experiment. So um, in 20, not 2020, no, because we were in lockdown, but 2021, um, I was finally able to film some media. So what I did to, um, to be able to have all these three formats, um, but with the same quality and with the same controlled environment and with the same cues in the media, um, was using an ambisonics microphone. Um, I used an ambisonics microphone. I'm not sure um, how specialized you all are in terms of, of equipment and, and systems, um, but an ambisonics microphone is a microphone that has four capsules and records in different angles, so it records very immersively. So I thought, oh, I can actually record that, uh, record um, common triggers, uh, just get an actor um, and get some props and record only like one time, like once with the same microphone. And then I can render that down in the three formats. So um, what I did was, oh, hello, no, yeah. there you go, yeah. So what I did was, I rendered the recording uh, using the omnidirectional capsule of the microphone, which is naturally mono. And then I downmixed the like the whole recording um, with the ambisonics, um, the uh, just the plugins on Pro Tools. So I rendered that and downmixed it to stereo um, using ORTF, which is a, um, a microphone array or a microphone array model in this in this um, case because it was all digital. Um, that is very similar to the layout of our ears, just two microphones with a specific angle, I think it's uh, 110, um, with a distance of uh, around 17 centimeters, if I'm not wrong. And uh, last but not least, I also downmixed uh, the media, the sound, into binaural using the KU100 HRTF or head related transfer function. So for those who are not familiar with those models, I'm gonna go back one slide, two slides, and this head over here, uh, which in our department we called Leopold, and Lydia used Leopold for some of, <laughs> of her experiments. Um, so this is a binaural dummy head, and we have the um, we have the algorithm to apply how this dummy here, a uh, dummy here, dummy head, perceives sound. Uh, so I applied these characteristics to the binaural sound and then the ORTF, which um, is uh, similar to this one, the stereo one. And then I thought, mm, but maybe it's not only about the sound, but what is what about the sound and also the audiovisual side of it? Because maybe, maybe it's not the sound that needs the visuals with the sound. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna test it, both audiovisual and sound only. And before I reveal to you uh, some of my results, I want uh, to do a little test with you. So um, maybe let's give some seconds in case someone doesn't have uh, their headphones at hand. Are you a tingle head? It would be really cool if um, you dropped on the chat before I go to the media. Um, if you dropped on the chat, if you experience ASMR. So if you can type on the chat, 
right now, do you experience ASMR? A tingling sensation in the head, the scalp, in response to sensorial stimuli? Yes, Raquel, Raquel says that yes, me too, although not, not in a traditional way. Most videos might make cringe, actually. Raquel, another Raquel, <laughs> says, hi, Clau, I do. Samantha, me too. Um, Clau, she, they. <laughs> that's, that's a, I guess, like my hologram in a different, in a parallel um, universe. I'm kidding, that's my partner using my computer. Um, doesn't, uh, huh? so Simon, occasionally, Lydia, yes. Margarita, yes. Diego, yes. Very enthusiastically, yes. <laughs> Sometimes, uh-huh. Anyone else? I don't think so. Uh-huh. Okay. Cool. So, grab your headphones and I'm going to play some media that I uh, produced from my experiments in uh -huh. and let's see if you experience ASMR And I'm going to change to some um, videos. Okay, so did anyone experience ASMR with 
that combination of of triggers. Not all, all of them. Um, do you remember which ones gave you ASMR, Raquel? I'm sure it was the last one. <laughs> I think it was metal sponges, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, the metal sponges. Oof, that's my favorite. And the coming, yeah, same. <laughs> the one near the beginning. Um, the doctor or the cutting sand? Cutting sand. Ooh. <laughs> you you um you're saying the ones that give me ASMR. So the combing, the uh, cutting sand, and the metal sponges. That's that's quite cool. Connected sand. Yeah. Mm. I know. Um, ones that I discovered the metal sponges. Oof. What do you mean, um, metal sponges? Oh, right. That's really interesting because if I listen to metal sponges in real life, I don't feel anything. If I touch them, I don't like them. I mm -mm, it's like ugh. Although I use them to like wash my my dishes, but but I don't like the sensation. However, if I listen to that. The, to the recording, it keeps me ASMR and is my favorite trigger, uh, recording trigger, uh, record trigger, um, which is really, really interesting because uh, I'm more of a visual person. I, I experience more ASMR. When it comes to media, I experience more ASMR with visuals rather than sound. I experience misophonia, um, which is hatred for specific sounds. So I'm very, very sensitive and I, mm -mm, it's really rare that sounds um, cost me ASMR. Um, yeah, so um, I wanted to clarify something. So the, the term ASMR became super popular on the internet, became viral. And the thing is that when you say ASMR, people think of the videos rather than the sensation. So when you ask some uh, uh, like someone, do you experience ASMR? People might reply saying, oh yeah, but they might mean, oh yes, I watch the videos that are designed to intentionally um, produce that sensation rather than, oh yes, I experience the tingling sensation and the relaxation, etc." cetera. So, um, it's, I think, really, really important uh, moving on in research to make that distinction between the ASMR, the actual experience, and ASMR inducing media. Uh, Simon says, senses are commonly modulated by all the senses. Vision alters oral say, se sensation, etc. Yeah, that's true. That's, uh, that's completely true. And there is some debate on whether the sensation of ASMR is some sort of misophonia, some sort of um, sound or um, just like stimulus emotion, um, sort of um, synesthesia, or if it's just affect. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, interesting uh, that uh, most people experienced, uh, the people who experienced ASMR with disc clips experienced um, um, ASMR um, with the ones that I experience ASMR mostly. Okay, so now I'm going to play three clips, but these clips are going to be audio only. Mm -hmm. So I want you to listen to this. I will like jump from clip to clip, but I will tell you when. Um, and I want you to identify which one you find more immersive. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me go. I'm not sure if da, 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 da. I need to share again this. Mm -hmm. Cool. So this is clip D. I invite you to just close your eyes 
and listen. Remember, with headphones, because if you don't have headphones, this is not going to work. <laughs> okay, here it goes. That was clip D. I'm going to play clip E. That was clip E. I'm going to play clip F. Okay, so I would like you um, to write on the chat if you experienced ASMR and um, which clip you found more immersive, clip D, E, or F. E, D, E, or F, or like one, two, or three. Let's give some minutes, well, some seconds, slightly on clip A, okay. And really so interesting, fascinating. Margarita, um, do you mean like you found more immersive clip F? Interesting. Wow. That is, uh, yeah, that is really, really fascinating. Fizzy feet, but I'm not sure if it was ASMR or not. 
Mm, yeah, some people, um, some people talk about a precursory sensation that maybe it's not ASMR, but it's like um, some people who experience migraine have an aura, so they start having sensations that tell people that they're going to have a migraine. So I think it's the same case with ASMR, including myself. I notice that I start like kind of like zoning out or relaxing a lot, and then I I feel the tingles, for example. Interesting. Something felt different on clip of uh, cool. Well, I'm gonna reveal what uh, we have in here. Just hold on a second. Before I reveal that, actually, um, I'm going to tell you that clip D was binaural, clip E is stereo, and clip F is mono. So it's really fascinating that um, the, it's just like different perceptions and the way you find immersive um, some sounds that are not even like rendered in, in, in an immersive format, which is mono, right? Um, that's really, really fascinating. And I think these results are consistent ish. I know like this, the sample of this, of this webinar is very small. Um, but there's some consistency with, uh, with the results that I found in my experiments. So from uh, 19 participants, let's call them the valid results because I had more people, but just these were um, uh, the participants that I was able as well to uh, measure their heart rate and all that stuff. Um, turns out that um, the stereo auditory presentation or modality, people found that more immersive than the binaural one. And they found more immersive the auditory version of it versus the audiovisual. So I think it's really uh, interesting to think about um, what um, uh, I think it was Simon. Yeah. So Simon mentioned how commonly um, like senses sometimes mask other senses um, and how can that how that can um, interfere or how that can impact our perception um, of the other senses. And it's, yeah, I, I found really, really fascinating that um, most people found um, more immersive the ORTF um, stereo um, sound rather than the binaural, because the binaural is um, like it's supposed or it's intended to replicate human hearing. Um, again, I used um, a very traditional model, the dummy head the uh, KU100 um, uh, head related transfer function and which I'm not particularly a fan because it's not very immersive for me but uh, there's uh, other uh, HRTFs like YouTube, um, th uh, YouTube VR, Facebook 360, even uh, Dear VR that when I applied those to my own sounds, when I rendered my sounds with those they felt way more immersive for me compared to the um, to the KU one uh, hundred. So Lydia said, uh, "D was louder and clearer the movement. E more immersive from my side." Oh no, that's Lambert though. Sorry, what? Yeah, E more immersive from my side, whilst F a lot of high frequencies. Wow, that's fascinating. Okay, so Simon says, the first part of E was a little like listening to a fire. Mm, I love that. Thinking of prehistory sitting around a fire, Robin Dunbar suggests it aided the development of language through storytelling by extended day length. Mm, perhaps ASMR played a part through communal relaxation. It's, it's possible. Um, ooh, hold on. So that is um, it for for me. <laughs> so I don't know if you have um, questions or more comments, or if you'd like to just jump on on a conversation. Thank you again so much for having me, and thank you everyone for attending. And yeah, the the stage is yours. Uh, if you want to jump in with questions, I'm really happy to um, to just like have a chat, like yeah, just like a casual chat or 
or answer any questions. And also, if you have, um, if you have questions after the, the webinar, feel free to contact me to my email, cloud.nather at york.ac.uk. Uh, and you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm like cloud um, underscore nader. And you'll find me on Twitter. Um, but yeah, feel free to just drop questions. I'm, I'm a very cu curious person, so I, I love questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claudia, for this uh, fantastic, immersive and unusual presentation. Um, I'm sure we have uh, we're going to have some interesting questions. As we are not a big group of people, I invite participants to raise their hands and unmute themselves if they want and share their comments. So who want to start? Um, um, hi, I'm Raquel Jimenez, and I wonder if we know what happens in the brain when we have these sensations. Because for me, I've always, I've always thought of it as an evolutionary thing, as what we feel when we are grooming each other. Like, for instance, taking away the how do you say piojos in English? Uh, you know, Lice. Yeah. I think the lices, yes, like what <laughs> monkeys do, they take away the lices, and that reminds me of when my grandmother uh, ruined my hair, and um, the sensation is very similar. The, the, this this dopamine release that you have when when you're in the hairdresser, when someone touches your hair, or even when they pick at your hair a little bit, and you have this suddenly this uh, pleasant sensation and the sound, or at least the sounds that I do find relaxing or that they do um, uh, trigger me some kind of uh, pleasant sensation, they are, they are all related to, to this sound, to this, um, I don't know, I wonder if it, it, it's part of our nature in terms of a social animals that we have to touch each other and we have to clean each other and it's a way that we show our relations within the group and that's the way in which we keep ourselves clean at the same time we establish uh, familiar links. I don't know, I've, thought, I've always thought of it like that so I wonder if you know something else, what happens in our brain when someone feels pleasure when, I don't know, see some, some someone cutting soap, for instance. <laughs> Um, we're in a very early stage of research when it comes to ASMR because even though the sensation is not new, it's been like people have experienced ASMR um, for decades and decades and de decades and there is even um, evidence on literature, uh, for example, Sylvia, Sylvia Plath um, describing the sensation in, in her books, um, even though obviously it, it was not named ASMR. Um, but because the term is so new, uh, it was coined in 2010, there's not much research on, on what's going on. And obviously, as you might know, it's really hard to get funding for research um, and uh, mostly uh, with um, in-person participants and when it comes to neuroimaging and um, these like um, very specialized uh, studies. However, some studies uh, have revealed that uh, first of all, there is um, some reduction in heart rate when people experience ASMR and when, when they are exposed to this type of media and experience ASMR, um, including my research, which I have evidence that people, yes, their heart rate decreases to a level that is comparable um, to the relaxation that happens um, while meditating or while practicing mind, mindful, mindfulness, for example. Um, and um, Dr. Uh, Julia Poerio's uh, paper 20, uh, 2018, ASMR More Than a Feeling, um, it's a really fascinating paper and it was the first paper of its, um, of its type that showed that, yes, there is a decrease in heart rate. However, there's also arousal. There's not arousal in sexual arousal. However, um, they uh, measured skin galvanic response and how, like the temperature um, of your body. And there was these results combined where people were relaxed, but at the same time, at some point, they experienced euphoria. So it's a very complex um, response, psychologically and physiologically speaking. Now, when it comes uh, more to neuroscience, there's not many studies, uh, but there's a few that um, show 
that people who experience ASMR compared to people who don't have different uh, neural activity, especially in the regions of the default mode network that is linked to um, resting states. So um, resting states and, and states of deep focus as well. So it's really fascinating that it might or might be not, we still don't know, but I'm speculating here, that people who experience ASMR um, might like oscillate <laughs> to the side of neuro atypical people rather than uh, just like normal behavior or just um yeah just like typical behavior or what is the norm um because um yeah the the yeah just brains are different right um that from one side and another quite recent experiment was uh, conducted at goldsmiths uh, Dr. Tom, Tom Swart, um, they explored people's brains with electroencephalograms uh, while they were experiencing ASMR while watching videos. And turns out that um, there is a huge decrease in low frequencies in alpha frequencies. So these frequencies are linked to sleep and deep relaxation. And there is a huge increase, uh, sorry, there's an increase of those frequencies, of alpha frequencies that are linked to relaxation. There is, um, there was a decrease of high frequencies linked to stress, which I think are beta. And there was an increase of frequencies, gamma, that are um, linked to intense focus and to deep, um, to deep thoughts, um, which um, is a sign that people indeed relax or there's a correlation between being super relaxed and experiencing ASMR. And also uh, that there is um, a lot of introspection slash mindfulness, uh, like being present, but without thinking much, if that makes sense. Um, so that's what we know so far. There's still a long way to go in terms of of research, uh, but that's what we know so far. And there is um, just some qualitative studies that show that people who experience ASMR, um, their personality traits uh, are more, are higher for empathy. So that would also be potentially linked with the part of neuroatypical because neuroatypical people um, have uh, way different levels of empathy versus uh, typical uh, neurotypical people. So yeah, that's what we know uh, so far. I don't know if that gave you some uh, hints. Yes, uh, thank you. So we are quite a neuroatypical and empathic crew. <laughs> I'm sure we are, definitely. <laughs> um, yes, Margarita, raise hand. No, I, 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 I'm sorry, I need to. Let me do it here. <laughs> We've got the screens now. Uh, okay, a minute. Um, just to avoid the... Yeah. No, I was I was thinking, uh, but you uh, mainly have answered. I I don't. I'm not sure. I think I am uh, in the group of the non very much um, ASMR, <laughs> and uh, so why why. Other people, you said um, that there's this the question of empathy, but what else do you have? Um, why are there these? Differences? We don't know. the The short answer is we don't know. We have no clue, and that's uh, one of the dollar, uh, the million dollar questions. Like, why do some people experience ASMR and why some people don't? We have no clue, and also, um, we still don't know if that's mostly physiological or if that's mostly affective if that makes sense so if it's just part of the mechanics because of the actual stimulus or if that's more linked to affective responses which i think it's way more linked to affective responses just because of the social connectedness and the um uh, the um, close personal uh, 
close personal attention of that is a common trigger for many people but yeah we have no idea because i was wondering um whether you had um i mean before before when 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 in your three examples um the way in which i reacted had to do with my own experiences mm -hmm. and the third one even i mean i could see that the first one was binaural and so on uh, but uh, but the third one was like st having someone next to me and uh, like <sighs> having yeah and and that meant you know I, I could feel much more so it was sort of linking it with personal experiences as I was thinking as as, as being in a hospital and okay. you're ill and someone is doing things around you and that sort of triggered me to feel certain things so that's why um, I thought that whether I, I wanted to ask you whether you were asking people um, if they I mean why they had chosen one particular piece and uh, of of the three of them or clip um, and um, and whether it was linked to certain thoughts or what what, what their feelings were you know, yeah, if, if anyone wants to like contribute to that um if you remember the the three clips if you remember the sort of trigger that caused more asmr or if, if the clip the, the part of the clip that you felt more immersed or more absorbed um if um i don't know if you noticed but i didn't include any speech in um, my in my stimuli this is because speech is so complex it's just next level sound complications right because we have semantics because we have um, cultural differences um, because we have the actual meaning of sounds uh, of sounds of um of words etc etc um so it's like you you could say that okay maybe the the clips or the videos where where um, actors are speaking or referring to the audience there's a very clear simulated interaction or simulated connection um but then what about the other stimuli what about the metal sponges that if i see if i see hands i feel asmr but if i hear the metal sponges i hear asmr um yeah it's yeah it's really i'm i'm really fascinated that people that some people felt the mono recording very immersive <laughs> Ambisonics should be very happy about that, actually. <laughs> yeah, shall I uh, ask a question related to this? Sure. And Simon can can uh, make his. Um, all all this we are discussing about uh, the the playback modalities you are exploring. Make me un make, make me ask. Um, have you found something uh, regarding the the differences between using headphones or maybe an immersive uh, loudspeaker uh, array or these kind of things? I haven't uh, experimented with loudspeakers. Um, I my intuition tells me that people will experience ASMR independently of headphones or speakers because sometimes people are are watching ASMR inducing videos on their phone or just on their computer. Um, and maybe it's not only about the playback system, but about their environment. So where people are. And um, some some participants, both on my pilot and in the like the actual experiments, they commented on the environment. First of all, the pilot I conducted it it in a room that was very office looking. Um, and part of the feedback was, mm, I think if the room was a little bit cozier or with not so much light, um, it would have been, I would have experienced more, more ASMR. And then in the final experiments, um, the picture that I have, uh, 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 this picture, 
um, this is the experiment room. I'm gonna go to the, oh, I don't know if you can see it better. Yeah. So this was basically a, a sound studio. I covered everything with, with black fabric. Um, and I just put a sofa there. It was very cozy and absolutely dark. And because it was a sound studio, it was super quiet. Um, and people mentioned that they were not sure if they experienced ASMR because of the actual stimuli or because they were so cozy and just watching the video so cozy in that dark place and the experiments lasted a while. So imagine uh, there were seven modalities, just uh, six modalities like binaural, stereo, mono, both audiovisual and, and auditory, and then the control clip. So they were in that room for a while, right? <laughs> um, however, they listened to everything with headphones. I'm really curious though, um, and that's one of my interests for future research. If if we change the HRTF and rather than using Leopold's or like the KU100, if we use personalized sound, would that make a difference though? My intuition tells me I don't think so, but it would be really, really fascinating to see if that makes a difference. Um, because if we um, if we transfer all this to potential therapeutic uh, practices, then obviously the workflow uh, in terms of production, sound production, media production becomes way easier and way more accessible um, rather than if we needed binaural sound or, or even stereo. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll see, we'll see. I think it's, uh, it's going to be really interesting. Um, I'm going to be in Cheltenham. Cheltenham Science Festival Cheltenham in June and I'm gonna perform some ASMR inducing um, things and we're gonna have speakers there so um, it's yeah there are no headphones it's gonna be my first time so yeah it will be interesting to see what happens there let, yeah let me know what you get <laughs> Simon please okay hello hi hello that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'd like to start by going back to what Raquel said about the comparison with picking off lice. And I'll link it to Robin Dunbar, who I already mentioned in the chat. And he, he compared the development of language and singing to when your social group in primates became too large to allow you to efficiently pick off fleas from everyone or lice. Um, so he was saying that language and singing developed as grooming at a distance. And his work suggests that grooming produces natural opiates. So part of the effect could be um, endorphins in our body make giving us that sensation. Um, I work in a primary school, um, which is in Britain about years for ages four till eleven, and it can be a hard, hard job. And I do, <laughs> I do some work with a, a kid who needs one to one, so just social interaction, and we build Lego together, and she says. Oh, the best bit of Lego. It's pressing those bricks together. Oh, that click. And she shudders when she said it. And when she's feeling very, um, whoa, interactive, she'll say, oh, oh, here you go. You can do the click. Um, and it's clearly, a, a, I don't know, a, a part of the reward system, I'm guessing, in the head. Um, and since I'm coming at it from archaeology, I'll suggest that I had a paper a few years ago which talk, looked at different methods of sound production in Paleolithic aerophones, and you can play them as flutes, and you can play them as trumpets, and you can put a reed in and play them as a clarinet. But if you hold them to your ear and you just tap your fingers on them, 
the effect is like a little tiny glockenspiel and it's oh it's very very pleasant but no one else near you can hear even if they're standing about two feet away it's a very very personal experience from playing that instrument and and it works who's to know how sound was originally produced in those instruments and I remember a guy, Lars Christian Koch, who's one of the early um, organizers of the International Study Group of Music Archaeology. And he presented a paper on, I can't remember the name of the instrument, but it's from the Indian subcontinent. And he said, there's no audience can experience it. It is entirely for the musician. It is so quiet. And I'm wondering if part of that is is again that very personal ASMR experience. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that, Simon. Um, yeah, I agree. It it must be linked absolutely with that affect, with that um, probably belonging. Um, not only I think in a um, not in a um, sensorial way but if you i don't know if you're very familiar or not with uh, the asm the asmr community but uh, it's gone absolutely viral and it's massive worldwide and it's become a culture it's become um, a real community there's like forums and there's twitch uh, like twitchers or um, youtubers etc and there's millions of people that have found belonging to this ASMR community their their thing, like finding your tribe. Uh, some people like literature, some people like skating. Uh, well, people like ASMR in Disney media and uh, the community has become very, very, um, yeah, I guess like uh, people feel that belong and uh, some sort of um, a familial um environment as well and the same with the the creators youtubers especially they they're like not role models precisely but they're people that um use their platforms as well to kind of create a raise awareness of um some social issues and to support people as well and to visualize um many uh, things like new divergence or gender identity, etc., etc. So it's not a surprise that so many people across the globe find not only the the stimulus per se um, engaging or stimulating, but also the actual activity and like joining and belonging to um, to part of the community. I don't know if there's any other questions, comments. Thank you, Clau. Um, anyone else want to ask something or make any comment? No? OK, so thank you very much, uh, Clau, for this uh, presentation. Um, I hope you share your results with us. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. All your experiments. Thank you. And Can thank we... you everyone for attending as well. And uh, our apologize again for the problems at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone for attending. And I'll hope to continue the conversation at some point. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Sure. Bye.